Hi everyone, it's Nell with Little Yellow House Crafts. Welcome back to my channel. Today I have a different kind of a video for you and I really appreciate all of you who um, gave me your, your input last week about what kind of content you were interested in seeing. It was really helpful for me um, to know kind of what your interests are. And I'm happy to say that most of you were very um, open to different kinds of content. There were a few people who asked that um, if I do a video that's on a different topic that I clearly label it as such so they can skip it if they'd like and I'm happy to do that. But I have felt led to do a different kind of video today and I think, sorry, I have an itchy nose, as always, as soon as I start making a video. Um, first of all, for those of you who are new, who maybe haven't been here before, my name is Nell and this is my channel which is usually about crafts, specifically cross stitching. Um, I am a cross stitcher and I really love that craft. I also do other crafts from here to there. I dabble in a little bit of quilting, which you'll see in an upcoming video. Um, but I have recently felt led to make a video on this topic. I think because of the current world situation we are in, I know that there are a lot of new homeschooling families out there and um, I am by no means an expert. My kids are still young and we're only about a year and a half into our homeschooling journey, but I just thought I would share my experience quickly, share with you what materials we use that we find to be useful and helpful, um, because I know there's a lot of uncertainty right now with, um, with schooling in the COVID situation. There's a lot of people who are still debating whether or not they want to send their children to school. If they don't want to send them to school, should we do distance learning? Should we homeschool? So I'm just going to share our journey and what we're using in the hopes that this is helpful to some of you. And you know, if you're not interested in this topic, no problem. I'll see you next week for a regular cross stitch update. Um, but I know that there are a lot of families out there with questions and are doing their research right now and probably feeling overwhelmed as I did when I first started. So a little bit about my family. So I am a homeschooling mom. I have three boys. I have a six-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-year-old. So this year I am just schooling my two eldest and we are doing first grade for my six-year-old and kindergarten for my five-year-old. Although you will see that grade levels in homeschool are very flexible. Um, it's easiest for me to just tell people oh, I have a first grader and a kindergarten gardener, but um, in actuality it's a little more nuanced than that and you'll see that coming up. Um, one of the beauties of homeschooling to be honest is to be able to be more flexible with levels and where your child is in any given subject. Um, we started homeschooling because I felt led to do so. Uh, when my oldest was about two or three years old I felt impressed that I should start looking into the option of homeschooling. And at the time I was vehemently against it. No, I don't want to do that. That's too hard. That's not me. I wasn't homeschooled and I turned out fine. Um, but as he grew older, the thought kept coming back to me, kept coming back to me. I did enroll my, my two older boys in preschool um, when my oldest was four and my younger son, my middle son was three. And they did a year of preschool and they loved it and there were no problems with it. There was absolutely nothing wrong. They had the most excellent teachers. Um, but I still felt like I should homeschool. And so finally, I just basically told the Lord, all right, I get it, I'll do it. I don't want to, but I'll do it. And as soon as I made that decision and committed to God and to myself and to my family that I was gonna do this, all of a sudden my attitude changed and I became very excited about it. And I really was interested in different philosophies to education and, and really jumped into things with, um, with both feet. We've had lots of false starts. We've had we've tried lots of things that didn't work for us. We've tried lots of things that have worked wonderfully. So I'm going to share those with you today. First of all, a little bit about my homeschooling philosophy. I am most heavily influenced by Charlotte Mason. Charlotte Mason was an educational philosopher in the 1800s, and her philosophy is very... Um, 
prevalent in a lot of homeschooling families. She had a very um, diverse and liberal view of education, liberal meaning many subjects and a wide, um, exposing children to a wide variety of subjects in small doses. Basically, a little goes a long way, and if you make it diverse and delectable, as she liked to call it, they will love it. This is her book on home education. She wrote an entire series of books on education. They are a little hard to get through um, because she wrote them in the 1800s, so the language is quite elevated. She was a very intelligent woman. But I do love this book in particular on home education. Um, this has been really influential on me as a homeschool parent. Another one that I highly recommend that I do not have a copy of myself. I checked it out from the library when I was first researching all of this. It's called For the, For the Children's Sake. And I will um, link it down below. And that one um, is a... It takes the Charlotte Mason philosophy and distills it down. It's a very thin book, very easily digestible, and just gives you a sense of what Charlotte Mason education is all about. We'll talk more about that in a minute. The other philosophy that I find myself highly influenced by um, is a more recent development, and it was developed by a woman named Marlene Peterson, and it's called The Well-Educated Heart. And I will link her um, website down below. Everything that she offers is free on her website. And her entire philosophy of education, she is a mother who homeschooled all of her children. She had a lot. She had eight, nine children, something like that, homeschooled all her children. And she developed her website as a resource for families. And it's all about heart education, basically meaning you can't teach the mind until you warm and open the heart of any person, but particularly children, right? How many times have we tried to force our children to do something when really what they needed was just a few minutes of our time to love them, to show them that we're paying attention to them, to listen to their thoughts and ideas and concerns. And then once that happens, it's like they blossom and all of a sudden we are able to lead them where they need to be led. And that's kind of the idea behind the well-educated heart. Highly recommend Marlene Peterson's work. I think it's wonderful. Um, I wouldn't consider myself a Charlotte Mason or a well-educated heart purist, so to speak. I kind of draw what is useful to me and my family from both of those philosophies and we implement them into our homeschool. And you're going to see, we are very eclectic because we've tried things that didn't work and now we have things that do work better for us. And I'm sure we will continue to make adjustments and change um, as we go forward. So that being said, let's get right into it. What does our homeschool day look like? What kind of curriculums do we use? So here we go. Um, first thing, we homeschool year-round. We do not take a summer vacation because we don't have to. We are a homeschooling family and we can homeschool year-round. Now before you say, oh that sounds horrible, you poor children, we take lots of vacations. We just take them at different times throughout the year and we take them more frequently. We can take a vacation every month if we want to. Um, the beauty of homeschooling year round means that we have a lot more days to fit in all of our schooling. Um, if you can imagine a regular school year for a traditional school schedule is 36 weeks or approximately 180 days of schooling a year, we have 52 weeks to squeeze 180 days of schooling into, which means we only have to school 15 days a month. 15 days a month. We could take an entire week off of school every month if we wanted to. We don't. We will take a day here, a day there. Sometimes if we have a bigger vacation, we'll take a whole week. But I love schooling year round because it gives us so much more flexibility. So that being said, we start off our day with something that we call morning basket. A lot of families have a morning basket system and it looks different for every family, but this is our morning time. This is what we do first thing. We gather together around the dining room table because that's where we school. And we start with um, family studies, not family studies, it's like opening exercises, right? Morning time. And we start by saying the Pledge of Allegiance. We um, have what we call our family values. That's our family um, picture. And we have values that um, align with our family motto, which is our family motto is faith, family, freedom. And we have five values that fall under each of those categories. So we have five family values about faith, 
five family values about family and five family values about freedom. And in a nutshell, the faith values relate to our relationship with God and our responsibilities to God and to our spiritual well-being. The family values, the five values under the category of family, um, relate to our responsibilities to each other and our family, our family rules, um, how we do our family, you know, our family culture. Those are our five family family values. And then we have our freedom values. And our five freedom values um, relate to our relationship with ourselves, our self um, independence, our integrity, our honesty, you know, who we are as a person, as well as our relationship with society as a whole. So our responsibility to the community and to our nation and to, and on and on. So you get the idea. So every week we pick a family value. For example, let me just pull one up. Here we go. So in our family, family values, value number one is we respect, honor, and quickly obey parents. So every week we pick a family value and we go in order. So in 15 weeks we will go through our entire cycle of family values and then we go back to the beginning. And for, say, this was our value for this week, we would read it. I would have my children repeat it. My children are not reading fluently yet, so we still do a lot of verbal um, memorization. So we would read it. Um, say it together, and then we have a scripture that goes with it. You can see we've done it a few times already. And this scripture is from Ephesians about, you know, obeying your parents and the Lord. So we have a scripture that goes along with our value. And then I have a picture, a painting, um, usually a piece of beautiful fine art. And this one just shows a mother with her two small children. And we discuss how the painting or the picture... Um, connects with our value and our scripture for that week. And we will repeat that um, first thing every morning for that entire week. So we will do that value and that scripture five times before we put a sticker on it. And then the following Monday, we turn the page and we get the next one. So that goes first, family value. We have the scripture that goes along with it. We then usually sing a song together. For us, as a religious family, it's a, it's a hymn or a children's hymn um, that we are working on. If you are not a religious family, you certainly could use folk songs. Charlotte Mason was a huge proponent of learning folk songs. And all of this is to help children train their ear to music and learn how to differentiate pitches and tones. Um, super important and really easy. Kids love to sing. So we sing a song and then we have a prayer. Again, we are a, a family of faith. So we um, then have a, a morning prayer to start our school time. Then comes our subject of the, of the day. This is still part of our morning basket and this changes every day. On Mondays, we do art. And on we have used a few different resources for our art, but since my children are still young, we treat this very much in a Charlotte Mason style. This is just a picture study. We are not learning about art theory or, you know, line and shadow and color. No, 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 no. We are just looking at beautiful pictures and saying what we notice about them. So for this, I've used a couple different resources. I love these picture study portfolios. These are available um, at Simply Charlotte Mason's um, website, simplycharlottemason.com. Um, beautiful, beautiful resources. Each one of these portfolios is about $19, I think. Right now, we are learning about Vermeer. And so these portfolios come with, this was our, our painting for this week, the geographer. So they come with beautiful um, prints of the paintings by the artist. I think there's eight in each, yes, there's eight paintings in each portfolio, and you get them on beautiful cardstock. We pull one out a week and study it for the week, and then we will put it into our portfolio here of art that we've already completed, and I'll show you that in a minute. And then the next week, we pull a new one out. We typically do about six weeks on one artist before we switch, so we won't get through all eight of these paintings. We will likely get through six, and then we'll put Vermeer away and study someone else. Um, so that is one resource for art study. We seriously spend five minutes on this. We look at the painting, we pass it around, and each person gets a turn to say something they notice. Like, I might notice the glow that he has on 
top of his cabinet and we might discuss why a geographer would need a globe. Um, my son um, might notice the colors, that there's lots of blues and golds in this painting. Um, my other son might notice the light that's shining in through the window. We just each get a turn to notice something about the painting and that's it. That is all it is. We will do that on Monday, and then throughout the week we have it hanging up on the wall on our whiteboard in our, in our school area, and we will refer back to it and practice remembering the artist's name and the title of the painting. Another resource for picture study images, if you don't wanna purchase this from Simply Charlotte Mason, because they are $19 a portfolio, if you go to a humbleplace.com, and this is recommended um, at Ambleside Online. Ambleside Online is a free curriculum that is Charlotte Mason based. Um, you can find that online, amblesideonline.com or .net or .org, I'm not sure. They list this under their art study. If you go to a humbleplace.com, um, this person has put together picture study portfolios of artists, some of which are free. Some are, they're PDF forms, so they're PDF downloads, which then you have to print out yourself. So if you don't have a good color printer, this might not be the best option for you. But if you do, this is a very economical way to do a picture study portfolio. Um, Peter Bruegel was free. And we did Peter Bruegel last year, and we just have in here all of the Peter Bruegel paintings that I printed out and that we studied when we were studying Peter Bruegel. We also did, last year we did Gustave Courbet. Um, earlier this year, like end of last year, beginning of this year, we were on Giotto. This is a Simply Charlotte Mason um, picture study portfolio, and we studied Giotto um, paintings, and then now we are on Vermeer. And we've done, obviously, a few Vermeer paintings already. And this past week we did The Geographer. So that's Mondays. That's what we do on Mondays, is art. Takes five minutes. My kids love it. My two little boys absolutely love it. And they know famous artists already. They know their names. They know what their paintings look like. They remember a lot of the titles of the paintings. So that's Monday. On Tuesday, Tuesdays, um, after all of our morning stuff, our subject for the day is logic. And I just purchased this at Amazon. This is Mind Benders by um, Deductive Thinking Skills, the critical thinking company. They do lots of little workbooks like this. This is grades pre-K and K, so this is a little bit below my kids' level, but I'm fine starting with an easier level as they learn how to fill these charts out and how to work it. Um, but these are just filled with logic puzzles. And again, my kids aren't reading yet, so I will help them read the clues. For example, a duck, an owl, and a squirrel are, um, are all different ages. Use the clues and the chart to find each one's age. So we have three different ages and three different animals, and then there's two clues. The animal without feathers was five last year. And the oldest animal spends a lot of time in the water. So they use their critical thinking skills and they figure out... Um, you know, which animal belongs with which age. And this book is just full of these puzzles. My kids love them. Again, takes five minutes. We do one logic puzzle um, every Tuesday. We do it as a group. I read the clues out to them and they figure them out and they, you know, work together to figure out the answer. So that's what we do on Tuesday is logic. Very simple. Um, I just bought one of those books and I make photocopies um, for each of my kids so I don't have to have more than one copy. <laughs> Sorry, I got a lot of stuff on the med. Wednesdays, we do poetry. Right now, we are doing Mother Goose. I bought this at a library book sale, so this doesn't actually belong to our library anymore. This belongs to me. Um, I love Scott Gustafson. If you've never heard of Scott Gustafson, he's a beautiful um, illustrator. And this is my favorite collection of Mother Goose. Just, I have a lot of Mother Goose books. I kind of love Mother Goose. Um, his illustrations are just delightful. Um, for example, let me show you a beautiful one. Hey Diddle Diddle, the cat and the fiddle. I mean, just beautiful, beautiful illustrations. If you have small children, the Itsy Bitsy Spider. Look. I just love his art. I really enjoy his style. Um, this is a cute one, the Crooked Man. There was a Crooked Man. Just delightful, right? So 
every Wednesday we sit and we read through four or five poems and then we choose one to memorize. And so my kids have worked on memorizing Humpty Dumpty, um, Jack and Jill, Yankee Doodle, uh, Jack Spratt, and one more I can't remember but when we finish with this we will go on to another set of poems I'm thinking for our next we probably have a few more weeks on Mother Goose and then I was thinking we might go on to one of the poetry books by A.A. A. Milne who wrote the Winnie the Pooh series either um now we are six or he has another book of poetry anyway we just read poems together and we work on memorizing a short one and my kids have to stand up when it's their turn to recite. They stand, arms by their sides, and they practice recitation. Um, so that's what we do on Wednesdays. Thursdays. On Thursdays we do music and this is probably my boy's favorite day of the week because we have been doing, um, we've been doing Squilt, which is super quiet uninterrupted listening time it's a website and we have been doing squilts meet the instruments exploring the orchestra so we have been learning about all of the instruments in the orchestra this was a pdf download that i bought on their website i printed out and then laminated and we have been learning about all the instruments in the orchestra when you purchase this um, curriculum it was only maybe 15 dollars. it was very inexpensive it also comes with a password to access on their website youtube videos that they've curated so kids can see the instruments being played they can hear what the music sounds like and we've been doing that on thursdays um, we are nearly done with this and so very soon we are going to probably start doing some other things we might do a meet the composers next and now that we've done meet the instruments um, but that's what we've been doing on Thursdays. Again, this usually takes 10 to 15 minutes and my kids love it and spend the next 20 minutes marching around the house pretending to play all manner of instruments and making an enormous racket, but they love it and they're learning. So that's what we do on Thursdays, music. And then on Fridays, our subject for the morning is nature, nature study. And we have been using James Harriet's Treasury for Children, this book is so beautiful this is an older edition i found this at the at the goodwill for 50 cents i believe so this is an older edition but it's exactly the same stories and the artwork is the same the artwork is beautiful let me show you the artwork is just lovely as you read these stories very accessible to children his stories are lovely these are all true stories from the life of james harriet if you're not aware who james harriet is he was a veterinarian in england in the i want to say the 20s and 30s um and he wrote about his experiences he has a whole series of books all things bright and beautiful all Creatures Great and Small, All Things Wise and Wonderful, The Lord God Made Them All, a series of four books about his experience as a country vet in England. But he also wrote this um, collection of stories for children, and each one takes about 15 minutes to read. They're not long, and my kids love them. All about animals. Um, other things we've used for nature study, I mean, we often just go outside and observe things. We look up. You'll see when we get to science, we have a lot of resources we use. But that's what we do on Fridays, is we read a nature story. After the subject of the day, we do our read aloud. Um, we change this up constantly. When we finish a book, we will choose something totally different. Right now, we are reading The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. I found this at a library book sale and this is awesome because this version of Wind in the Willows is entirely illustrated. There are illustrations on every page. Sometimes they're small like this and sometimes there's larger ones. You can see. But we've been following the adventures of Rat and Mole and Mr. Toad so far. We're only a couple chapters in. My boys are really enjoying it. I'm not sure they would like this book without the illustrations, so I'm really glad that I found this illustrated version. Um, I can't tell you anything about illustrated by Eric Kincaid. It's the Kenneth Graham unabridged The Wind in the Willows. Um, the publisher is Brimax or Brimax. Let me see if I can find out when it was published in case you're looking for it. 1986. Published by Brimax Books, New Market, England, 1986. So this is the version we are reading. They're enjoying that. We've also read 
the mouse and the motorcycle, Charlotte's Web, Mr. Popper's Penguins, the boxcar children. We've read a lot of books, but that's what we're on right now. So that's our morning time. That is the um, kind of eclectic side of our homeschool. That is all the stuff that I've collected that really resembles a Charlotte Mason um, type thing. Things that I think are important and valuable for my kids to know. Art, logic, poetry, music, and nature um, that we don't use an official curriculum for. And our whole morning time takes at max um, 15 to 20 minutes and then we move on to our regular curriculum. For um, regular curriculum we use a whole bunch of different stuff. Again we're very eclectic. For handwriting we use the good and the beautiful. This is my older sons. This is level one and this is my younger sons. This is level K because I have a first grader and a kindergartner. We do one page of handwriting a day. Um, this handwriting, let me find an unmarked. This handwriting is very easy to do one page a day um, and takes anywhere from five to ten minutes for them each to do their handwriting. So I will link all of these websites down below if you're interested in checking them out, but we use the good and the beautiful and I've been really happy with it so far. For our language arts, we also use the good and the beautiful and if you're not aware, levels one through five, levels one through six, on the Good and the Beautiful's website are available for free as a PDF download. Um, you can still purchase a physical copy if you'd like, but if money's tight and you'd rather print it off yourself, you can get them for free. My younger son, um, the thing about the Good and the Beautiful language arts, it's a little bit advanced, so you'll see that my kids are working a year behind on their language arts, and I think it's a perfect fit for them. If you have a child who's very advanced in language arts, then I would go right along with their grade level. If they're not, if they are average or maybe a little behind, I would stick with going down a year. So for example, my younger son is in level K primer, and my older son is in level K. So even though he's in first grade, you can see Charlie, even though he's in first grade, he's doing level K and Henry is doing level K primer. Um, love this language arts. It's very thorough. It's very academically sound. We don't have to supplement it with anything. Um, and it's beautiful. It's the good and the beautiful. It's very beautiful. There's art incorporated, stories. You can't see what I'm showing you here, but it's really, you can see some artwork in there. Look at that. So it's really a lovely curriculum and I quite enjoy it. For math, um, my husband and I are both kind of uh, firm believers in not delayed academics, but not pushing academics too early. Um, even though kids might be able to do something, it doesn't mean that they're developmentally ready for it yet. So we don't start math, and I know some of you are going to be shocked by this, we don't start math until first grade. In kindergarten, math consists of learning shapes, learning numbers, learning how to read the numerals. You know, my kindergartner can do basic addition with his fingers and he knows that two plus two equals four, but I don't make him sit down and do an actual math curriculum. We play a lot of games, we do tangrams, we learn about shapes, um, and you'll see we do supplement with something called math seeds, which I'll talk about later, but I don't make him do a math curriculum yet. My older son, however, is in first grade, so he is doing math. And we use as our math curriculum Singapore math. This is primary mathematics. Whoops. The number line just fell out. Let me just take those out. This is Singapore mathematics. Singapore math, primary mathematics. Singapore math has a couple different editions. Their newest um, program is called Dimensions Math. So you may have heard of Dimensions Math. We are using the primary mathematics US edition. This is the original. Um, this is not common core aligned. So if that's important to you, this would not be a good choice. We don't particularly like Common Core very much, and since we're homeschool, we don't have to do Common Core, so we don't. But if that is important to you, I believe Singapore Math does have programs that are Common Core aligned. So, there are options for you. We chose Singapore Math because it is very rigorous um, and really creates a strong, I mean it was developed in Singapore where they have some of the highest math scores in the world. Um, it's different than a normal, you, you might call a normal US uh, math curriculum. It 
uses a lot of mental math right from the beginning. It uses a lot of word problems right from the very beginning. We are in 1A and we are already doing um, word problems every day. Uh, it, it approaches mathematics in a different order than typical US programs. For example, my son is adding and subtracting up to the number 20, but he hasn't yet learned he knows, but he hasn't yet learned in his book to count to 100. Because Singapore math does things in a different order. They would rather children get a really strong number sense of 1 to 10 and then 1 through 20 and know it backwards and forwards and upside down before they go on to um, learning higher numbers. So it's, it's a different educational philosophy. I love it. It's a really good fit for my son and um, his attention span and the way he likes to approach math. So every day there's a little bit in the textbook we look at. The textbook is non-consumable. You don't write in the textbook. You just go through the things together. We have some manipulatives we use. Um, and then every day he has a few pages in either his workbook or his extra practice book or both. I do supplement with the extra practice book because Singapore math does tend to move fairly quickly and doesn't have a lot of drill, um, which may be great for some kids. For my son, he needs just a tiny bit more practice before things are set. So I just bought the extra practice book and we use this right alongside the other two um, and it's working wonderfully for us. So highly recommend Singapore math. Uh, we tried other math curriculums that just didn't work for us. They were too complicated, too many extra little manipulatives you have to buy, very expensive. This is fairly inexpensive. This is all you have to buy. Um, and then you can use manipulatives from the dollar store um, and it works wonderfully for us. So that's what my older son is doing for math. And my younger, my middle son will start math next year, probably with Singapore math because we love it. That is it for handwriting, language arts, and math. Um, before this video gets too much longer, let me briefly show you what we are using for science and history. Now, for kids as young as mine are, I do not believe that they need a full curriculum for science and history. I believe that Reading books is enough science and history for most kids this age. I think best time to start an official science curriculum is first or second grade, and then history, you know, second, third, maybe even fourth grade, depending. But again, I sort of lean towards the delayed academic side of things, so you may have different opinions and that's fine. Um, but we do use a few things, so I'll show you. Um, a new thing that I just got, and I'm really excited to try it, that we are going to try starting this coming week, is we're, we got a free year-long trial, um, year-long subscription to Mystery Science, which I've heard about. A lot of schools use it. It looks really fun, and basically it's a, it puts science in the context, context of, here's a mystery, now let's figure it out. And I just printed out... This is our wonder workbook and it says I wonder and then there's room to put your wonderings and your drawings and then you say you discuss the questions you've had, that you have and you write down I have so many questions and then you go to the website and they have videos that you watch and hands-on activities and experiments you can do so I just printed these out um, yesterday we will try this this week um, on Tuesday did I mention I don't think I did sorry we do handwriting, language arts, and math on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Again, we have 52 weeks. We don't have to do it every day to finish our curriculum in a year. So we do those, you might call them core subjects, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We do history and science on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So this will happen this coming Tuesday. We're gonna give mystery science a try. I'm really excited. I will link it down below. I don't know if they are offering their free year-long trial anymore, but it's not terribly expensive. It's, I think, I think it's less than $10 a month um, if you'd like to use it. But I will link it below and you can check it out if you're interested. Um, other things that we use for science, oh goodness, books. I am not a hoarder, 
But if there's anything in this world that I hoard besides craft supplies, it's children's books, okay? I love children's books. We read a lot and we have a lot of books that are great for science. So one that you might immediately recognize, Magic School Bus. We use, oh, this is history. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the Magic Treehouse books, which incorporates both history and science. This one's more sciency, Midnight on the Moon. We are in the process of reading through these with my big boys, which is why there's a bookmark in here, because uh, we've been reading them every night. We are so far, this is book number eight we are on now, and we are reading through the entire series. So the Magic Treehouse books. Um, these Smithsonian books, I love these. Seal Pup Grows Up, The Story of a Harbor Seal. We have seven or eight of these about all different kinds of sea creatures. So this is Smithsonian Institution, the Oceanic Collection. And we have these books about all different kinds of sea creatures. It's a story form of learning about different sea animals. They're beautiful. So the Smithsonian books. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? I have lots. Oh, we have the most of any of these, the Re Let's Read and Find Out Science. These are level two books. You've probably seen these before. What Makes a Magnet, uh, Flash, Crash, Rumble and Roll about thunderstorms. Uh, my boys love these. And these are science and they're just fun to read, beautiful illustrations, really accessible for kids. We love the Let's Read and Find Out um, science books and we have probably 40 or 50 of these. We've I've just collected them, found lots on eBay, found them at library book sales or at the Goodwill for 25 cents. So you can get these for very inexpensive if you haunt your thrift stores and your library book sales. Along the same lines, the I Can Read About series. Um, this is um, a science series that's very similar to Let's Read and Find Out. This is the I Can Read About, Frogs and Toads. There's a whole list of all the different ones they have and I think they have even more than that now. Um, these are great, we have probably 10 or 11 of those. These are great, the Biomes of North America, these are fantastic about environmental science, a walk in the tundra, and there's a walk in the rainforest, a walk in the deciduous forest, a walk in the desert, just talking about different biomes. Um, awesome. Let's see, I've got a few more science. Oh, this is more geography than science, but my kids loved this book and I plan on getting the rest of these. These are the books by Hauling C. Hauling. This one is Paddle to the Sea and we plan to purchase Men of the Mississippi and Seabird and all of the other um, books that he wrote because my kids loved this. This taught my kids about the geography of the Great Lakes region of North America. Each day we read one chapter, which is one page. There's beautiful artwork and this just follows the, the journey of a little, um, canoe that a, a Native American boy painted and sent and named Paddle and he sent Paddle on a trip to the sea from Lake Superior through all of the Great Lakes out to the Atlantic. It was such an adventure following, there he is, following Paddle to the sea on his adventure um, to the Atlantic Ocean. Geography in book form and my kids loved it so we will be getting more of those. The last ones that we use for science are obviously the DK books. Um, there are the DK eyewitness books, which most people are familiar with. They have so many of these. They also have the I Wonder books. There are fewer of these, but these are for younger kids. So you can imagine the DK eyewitness books, but simplified a little bit, made a little bit more accessible to younger children. Um, and we love these books. My kids will sit and stare at them. None of my kids are reading fluently yet and so they do need help um, reading the words but they often just like to look at the pictures in, this, in these. We have an I Wonder book about pirates. That is a perennial favorite around here. Um, so that's what we use for science. Honestly, we just read a lot of books. I'm excited to incorporate mystery science uh, into our science curriculum, if you can call it that. But honestly, I mean, at this age, reading these books is pretty much all they need. And they're learning so much about science just from reading these books. Also watching the Magic School Bus episodes. They love those. They love to watch the original, the old school Magic School Bus episodes. Great science right there. For history, we um, 
are taking a similar approach to history that we are to um, science where we're mostly using books. However, last year I purchased this and discovered we weren't quite ready for it yet, but I think we are going to use this this year. This is um, a curriculum by Beautiful Feet Books and Beautiful Feet Books um, is a company that creates history curriculums based on books, living books, read alouds essentially. And this is early, or, uh, early American history, a literature approach for primary grades. And it takes you through American history. The lesson you can see, whoops, the lesson manual is incredibly thin because each lesson Lesson 40, Lesson 41, Lesson 42, Lesson 43, they're very short. They tell you what to read and what, you know, hands-on activity or coloring page to do, and that's it. You both basically just read a lot of books. And the book choices, the quality of literature that Beautiful Feet Books uses for their courses is exceptional. So if you are looking for a great literature-based um, history curriculum, they have all grade levels available, all different programs, world history, U.S. history, um, different as different like time periods in modern history i can't even remember but like for all different grades for primary grades for middle grades for high school all the way up you could use just beautiful feet books for history all the way through 12th grade and you wouldn't need anything else so we are probably going to use this um this year and start implementing it soon i feel like my boys are more ready for this um but other things that we use we have 10 or 11 of these if you lived at the time of books or if you were present at such and such a thing. So this is if you lived at the time of the Civil War um, and they are again books with beautiful pictures that teach you know different aspects of history. We have a whole bunch of these. Um, yeah these are excellent. If you lived at, I can't remember if there's a series but that's what we call them. If you lived at for other history, um, if we're talking about music history specifically, um, I have two series that I love. The first one is Getting to Know the World's Greatest Composers. These are very easy to find, very inexpensive. These are still in print. This one's about George Handel, and you can see, again, very accessible for young children. Um, we have a whole bunch of those. And then we have these, the Famous Children series. I found these at a library book sale, and again, this one's about Mozart, and it's a storybook about Mozart as a young man um, and how he kind of got started. And then the last thing, this is more civics, um, and I know you're thinking, civics? with elementary school kids why yes indeed this is a series and I don't want to get too political here but we tend to be um, a little bit libertarian in our political views here at in our house so we um, are have a strong belief in personal liberty but also personal responsibility and anyway we love the Tuttle Twins books. These are written by Connor Boyack, who is a libertarian. He um, founded the Libertas Institute, which is a libertarian think tank. And he wrote these books to teach principles of liberty and responsibility and um, basic economic and civic principles that a lot of times people think are too difficult for children to understand. They're not, especially if you have a book like this, where we follow the Tuttle Twins as they, you know, investigate the law. This is based on, um, I'm going to totally butcher his name, Frederick Bastiat, who was a French political economist and a classic liberal who wrote The Law, upon which this book is based. He lived in the 1800s. And basically, Connor Boyack has taken principles of um, economics and civics and turned them into children's books and they're excellent so we really like these too there's nine or ten of them now and he's always coming out with more of these so we look forward to collecting more of these um, and those are the books we use for history and civics and you know oh there is another hold on lest I forget I have another favorite author for history, specifically American history, if you live in the US and want to teach American history, Cheryl Harness. <laughs> I love Cheryl Harness. She wrote some of the most beautiful books about 
American history for kids. Um, this is the revolutionary John Adams, and you have just got to see these illustrations. Guys, I don't know if I can put into words adequately how much I adore Cheryl Harness's work. I can't turn these. <laughs> She just, she's inc an incredibly gifted artist and historian. And we have many of her books. The Revolutionary John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, she wrote about George Washington, The Remarkable Benjamin Franklin. So she has a whole series of these on some of the founding fathers. We also have some on Abraham Lincoln. We have a few of her books on um, Mark Twain in the Mississippi she has. She has a whole series of a ghosts series, ghosts of the White House, ghosts of the Civil War, ghosts of the 20th century, and just takes you through some of the, the most famous figures in American history. And her writing and her illustrating is just spectacular. So Cheryl Harness, that's how you spell her name. I will try to link a lot of these down below. But we use a lot of her books in history as well. We just read them together. And that's our homeschool, guys. Um, we're at 45 minutes. I think that's long enough. That is our homeschool. That is what we do with our kids. All in, my kids spend um, an hour, less than an hour a day on school. But again, my kids are very young. And as they get older, that will probably lengthen and get longer and longer. We do supplement with readingeggs.com. We have a subscription to Reading Eggs and my kids get 15 minutes each on the computer every day to play Reading Eggs or Math Seeds, um, which are just reinforcing you know, early reading and math skills. Um, we don't do a lot of screen time in our home, but we do allow them to have 15 minutes on the computer each day to do Math Seeds and Reading Eggs. And that's it. So our day is not full. I know this seems like a lot, but in any given day, we spend an hour, an hour and a half on school, max. And then the rest of the day, they are playing, they're outside exploring, they're having, you know, get togethers with other families, getting, you know, interaction with other kids. That's been harder with COVID, but we still are getting together every once in a while at outdoor playgrounds where we can kind of be outside and the parents are all masked and the kids are all running wild. But, you know, we are doing our best to um, keep social uh, connections as we can. And then my kids do extracurricular activities. This fall, they're gonna do soccer and they're also gonna do tumbling. So you know, our days are full and varied, but we are not sitting at desks for hours and we really enjoy our school. It took me a long time to find a curriculum, or not a curriculum, curricula that I loved and found exciting to work on with my kids and wasn't drudgery. Um, because that's the most important thing. When you're setting up your homeschool, if you want to be successful, you got to find something you don't hate as the parent. If you do hate it, you're not going to want to do it and it's not going to happen. But I hope this was helpful. Thank you for bearing with me as I deviate from my normal um, topic of discussion this week. I just really felt like I should share this because hopefully it's helpful to some of you who may be embarking on this homeschool journey with your kids for the first time. Um, you can do it. You can. I promise you can do it. Um, don't be, don't feel like a failure if you try something and it doesn't work. Try something else. Readjust. There are so many resources out there and many of them are free or nearly free. So you don't need to break the bank and you can find great resources for educating your children at home. All right, guys, that's all I've got for you. Have a wonderful day. If you are homeschooling your children this year, good luck. My prayers and thoughts are with you. And if you are just here for stitching, I will see you next week with a regular cross stitch update. Take care, guys. Bye.